Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me see. You ought to hear a little pop. Okay. Ooh, I got some feedback here. That shows everything's working, I guess. All right. Welcome to today's show of uh, Strange, Strange World, named in honor of Mark Sargent's show, Strange World, which you first he- heard here maybe, oh, I guess over a year. Over a year. Oh, we got some Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs playing in the background. Let's cut them out. <laughs> so uh, if you if you ever get a chance, if you like Bob Dylan, uh, go and uh, Google Flat and Scrubs version of well, Don't Think Twice, It's All Rise, Rainy Day Women, and uh, particularly uh, Like a Rolling Stone. I mean, to me, uh, of course, I'm a Southern boy, but uh, I love the Flat and Scrubs version. In fact, a little trivia, which I don't need to know, they uh, that was kind of their breakup. Uh, one wanted to go one way, another wanted to stay in traditional kind of country, western vein. But we do have Mr. Mark Sargent on the line with us, and I'm going to just double-check here and see if we're getting clear. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's how I always tell. And uh, Mark has been very busy lately. My yeah. Goodness, I don't. Yeah. I don't see. I. I would. Uh, I would guess you've done a thousand interviews. No, no, no. I've not done a thousand, but I've. I've definitely done a couple hundred. You've done a lot. Yeah. I mean, you more have done hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, more than more than most people. That's that's for sure, and so now I've way more. And and I was uh, listening to uh, to uh, to some of your interviews, and uh, he has a show on Tuesday night. That and 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 I've got to write down this number. I didn't realize that you were doing this. Mm-hmm. Ah, gosh, let me see. Where's a pen? Mark has a number. If you're like me, if you're uh, don't have internet at the house and, 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 and don't care to have it, you have a number, if I'm not uh, mistaken, where you can call in and just listen to your show as it is. Right. Yeah, you can call in and I won't pick you up or anything. The number is 641-793-1111. Seven one one seven. That way, you can kind of find out what's what's going on. Yeah. And I gotta say, Mark, you have uh, one of the the best spoken, well spoken, most educated listeners that that I've heard. Uh, I mean, they they really come up with some great comments and questions. Yeah. And I'm sure you're proud to have them. I I am I am so fortunate to have the listeners that I do. And when they when they call and they 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 ask some great questions and most of them are, are sober. And <laughs> which you know, and you think well, you know, shouldn't they all be yeah, sober? Do. It's like it, it you'd be surprised. So well, you know, even even doing interviews on on the radio, uh, uh, um, I, I had a group that uh, I had previously worked with mm-hmm. that uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you for it. It, it was a um, kind of assisted living group, mm-hmm. and I I had invited them on, and they they were so uptight that they had stopped and hit the mimosas uh, before they came in, and they they were quite. Uh, Still lucid, but uh, uh, you know it, it, it kind of freed up their tongue a little bit. That right. otherwise, so I don't, I don't know if that's an, an entirely a bad thing. No, it, you know that's a Russian bad saying, bad. by the way. It's one of the I, I know several Russian sayings, and one of them is, "What's on a sober man's mind is on a drunk man's tongue." <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, I, I sat down last night, and I wrote literally pages and pages of things. I know we can't touch on all of them, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, it was kind of serendipitous before I came in today. They were doing a little documentary type uh, thing. Quick. Speaking of documentaries, you have just 
finished a year long or yeah. a group has just finished a year long uh documentary on flat earth following you around they and did on the premiere in canada yeah it's going to premiere in toronto next month i'm going to be flying up for that it is called behind the curve and it was done by a Los Angeles documentary team where they followed myself and Patricia Steer and several other people in the community basically for a year. So they, they started out coming up here to Seattle where I am and kind of feeling me out and seeing if it was worth, worth it to be a documentary and said, you know what, you seem normal enough that we might be able to do something here and not come off as completely insane. And so they spent some time up here, and then they went down to Houston to spend time with Patricia Steer. And then they went off to, you know, they went to a couple of meetups in Los Angeles and went out to Denver to a meetup with Globusters, with Bob from Globusters. And then they came back up here to Seattle and took me down to the eclipse, you know, the, the great American uh, eclipse that, that happened where it went started in the northwest and ended in the southeast of the united states and, and we went to the blackout zone and it was just fantastic the, the weather was perfect and they got some good footage there and then they followed me down to houston where patricia and i made a visit out to nasa and they ended the documentary by going to the national conference in raleigh just a few months ago in in november in north carolina and it was great. I mean, they, they got, I know I was with them almost every step of the way and, and they got some great footage and they took them, took them about three months to edit the documentary version of it. I, they've got enough footage. They could do a documentary series if they wanted to, but the, the raw documentary movie is called behind the curve. It's going to be premiering at a film festival. I believe it's called hot docs in Toronto. It's going to be the end of next month. And I am going to be sitting in a seat just squirming as they, as they, I didn't, I didn't understand why actors, you know, you see actors in award shows, they don't look when they show their clip on screen, the actors don't look. And I get that now because I, you know, even though I'm fairly comfortable on camera, I hate being on camera because I just don't see the same thing that the camera sees. So, uh, but yeah, it's gonna be gonna be a lot of fun, and we'll see what happens. We'll see. You oh, know. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be great. And and please let us know when, if that becomes uh, available for viewing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're, they're they're up there. You know, it's it's being shopped. You know, to to see who will pick it up as a distributor. And you know, does it go into the theaters? Does it go straight to Netflix? Does it? What happens with it? We don't know. But they will. They will let me. Uh, no, as they figure out more, and I'm I'm just excited and humbled to be a part of it. Hopefully, I represented Mark, the team uh, well. Go ahead. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Mark gave us a number for if you want to to call in, and I, I need to say that uh, he is on True Frequency Radio, which you can go through there. Yeah. Uh, every Tuesday night, it's ten o'clock Eastern time, seven o'clock is that Pacific? Yep, time? seven o'clock Pacific, eight. Mountain Nine Central, and so probably people within our listening roles are on Central and in Eastern Time. So we're right between the states. So, mm -hmm. um, so that that that's kind of important too. You you need to know that, and it's uh, it's a great great show. And I have loved the shows where you have just been mainly taking calls. The emails, you know, now you got some great emails in there. Yeah. Well thought out, but just the spontaneity of, of the of the questions that uh, come through via the phone, I think is I pretty I pretty have yeah, the, I love the phone calls and I get uh you know, I get a bunch of phone messages on my normal phone and then I have an unlimited stream of emails that come into my one email address, msargent23 at comcast.net, to where I have to do a separate email show every week. In fact, I'll do one tomorrow morning, spend another hour going through emails, and, and it's a losing battle. You know, I, I, you know, it just gets deeper and deeper every, every time I do it to where I don't know if I'm going to do two email shows a week or if uh, if i have time to do it but it's it's great people and again it's they're they're following up I, you know i put out the clues i say look do your own research and ask questions and that's exactly what they do i i get some of the emails are short some of them are pages long 
but it's 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 humbling I, I, to 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 see that sort of reaction come at you from the outside. You uh, you mentioned the clips, and that's one of the things I wanted to touch on a little bit. There were some uh, shadow problems I know with the clips, and and we we got to watch it. Uh, we were actually uh, uh, I got to see it with a, a little group, uh, and um, this was kind of weird. And I, when I first saw it, I thought, well, this is my glasses or something's weird going. We were looking it through a, a window. And where we are, it was not a total eclipse, but a good part was, you know, covered up. Mm -hmm. And we're watching it, watching it, and all of a sudden it doubled, it split into two. There was two moons, two suns. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what in the world? And one of the ladies had her her cell phone, and she was videoing it, and it was it showed up on the video too. It lasted just a few seconds, maybe 15 seconds, and then. Went back. Nothing else around, you know. Yeah. Did that? I just thought that was real weird. I don't know if anybody else saw that or. Uh, it was it tough to, to be where we were. Or? It was tough to pick up on camera. the The blackout zone, which I was in, which started in Salem, Oregon, and ended in South Carolina, so it went diagonally across the United States. The blackout zone was only seventy miles wide which I thought was really, really interesting. And it's, it's now turned into one of my five scientific questions that I throw, I'll throw at any academic, you know, because they, they like questions that they can sink their teeth into. And because the average mainstream scientist will say, well, the moon is 2,000 miles wide, but it only casts a 70-mile-wide shadow, a blackout shadow on the Earth. And that's a 97% reduction in, in shadow. You know, it's it's an amazing thing, right? And, it, but, and especially since we can't really replicate it here on Earth. That's the equivalent of you walking by a wall with the sun, you know, up in the sky and your shadow is the size of an action figure. You know, we, mm. we don't see that. And so... And, but they stick to it. It's like, no, no, the moon acts as a lens and focuses the shadow down. I go, okay. But you can't have it both ways because the Earth, if you believe in mainstream science, the Earth is 8,000 miles wide, about four times wider than the moon. But And so that shadow, if you believe in the 97% decrease in shadow, that, that blackout zone should only be you know, 220, 240 miles, give or take. But when we see the Earth pass in front of the sun, you know, to, you know, so you have the moon and then the earth supposedly passes in front of the sun. That's not what we see when, when it goes with the moon, we see this massive shadow that blocks out the entire moon with, with room to spare. And we don't see that pinpoint blackout zone, which should be about a day. It should be easily to see with the naked eye. You know, it should be a 10th the size of the moon that, that blackout zone. And we don't see that. So it's you know you can't um, so when scientists say oh you know the, the moon shadow should be this size and the Earth shadow should be this size uh, they're the, you know they're they're trying to bend it both ways and for us for anyone that's listening to this for the first time the seventy mile blackout zone fits with the flat Earth model way better than the the heliocentric model because we only say that the moon is about fifty miles wide. So a seventy mile wide shadow, that's fine. Uh, that actually works for us. So it's uh, it's an interesting little take, but it's one of those nice little nuggets I can throw at scientists nowadays. You know, and I I, I hate to to bring up the uh, the whole puppy in the overhead being thing, but it, it it's it's kind of reminiscent of of our education system and. You know, whatever we're told, you know, if you disagree, then you're you're labeled a kook or a troublemaker or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm I'm sure people sitting around who knew that was a bad idea to put the puppy in the overhead bin um, because of fear of hey, you know, I'm going to get thrown off the plane or whatever. Uh, you, you keep your mouth shut, and I think that happens a lot when. Uh, when people find out things that this just doesn't doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I had a um, test or saw a test that was used 
back in the mid to late 1800s to go, I believe, from the 5th to the 6th grade. Mm -hmm. And it was horrendous. You had three hours and a, a pencil. <laughs> really? And, I, and and it was it was just uh, it was advanced mathematics, uh, English rules, mathematic rules, geography. I mean, it, it was a a test that I guarantee you a typical college professor could not have passed. And it was to go to the sixth grade. I mean, just just our education system. Well, basically, what uh, the the lady that was over education when Reagan uh, was president has turned out to be something of a whistleblower. And she said, basically, in the uh, early 1900s, we turned our education system basically away from learning and thinking and I'm creativity to... to limited learning for lifelong labor. In other words, meeting the needs that, that labor said they needed. And creativity is not one of those needs. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Um, we were, um, right before I came, they were doing a, uh, I think I mentioned a, a, a Hubble documentary. And you know, okay. talking about when the Hubble went up and they had to go back and fix it. So they took one more uh, space shuttle trip up there, and and it was it was kind of interesting watching it. And I wish uh, uh, probably somebody out there has has recorded it, but just uh, my perspective from what I could uh, see, there were there were a few shots where the astronaut was working on it. This is you know low off Earth orbit, I'm sure. Right. And you know it's it's not the, if there is such thing as low Earth orbit, but they, it's it's not very high up. Let's just say it's not very high up. And um, the the um, astronaut looked like an astronaut should look. Little little bulbs there in in the suit that you would expect, and the space shuttle looked like it. I'm mean, not the space shuttle. The uh, uh, Hubble looked as like it should look. And in the background on those shots, when they did show the Earth, yeah. every time I saw it, it was a, a plain, flat plain. Yeah. In the shots where they just showed the Earth itself, you noticed a little curve. And in the shot where they showed a front view of the Hubble with an obviously distorted shape, there was a really big curve, which was probably through a fisheye lens or something like that. But hmm. uh, I think every once in a while, like in some of the uh, X-15 footage when they got up to uh, around 65 miles and they're, they're showing the the X-15, you can look in the background and all of the ones that I have seen showed a, a flat uh, plain earth behind it, which right. they uh, they weren't, weren't thinking of it at that time, I, I don't think, uh, you know. So, do you think, uh, it, it, what do you, what's, what's your, your, your stance on, uh, satellites? Uh, the, the, there's things up there that appear to be satellites, but I don't think they go up on any rockets. I think that they are used as part of the NASA high altitude balloon projects because if you use, especially if you use hydrogen balloons, because hydrogen gives you much more lift than helium and you can, you can manage, you know, you don't have just a forever lift, you know, you can manage the, the elevation that they, they go to, you know, we've, you can watch videos anytime you want on payloads that are up to four tons. And that's massive, even for for modern satellites. That's massive, and so I think there's stuff up there. Four, four, four tons. Four you? tons, eight thousand pounds. It's oh, wow. it's oh yeah. There's this great video of them launching one of those things with a very very big uh, hydrogen balloon, and a, a gust of wind caught it when it was still on the ground, and it slammed into an SUV and just made it totaled it. And, you know, I'm sure they had to, you know, can't abort the launch because even though it, the uh, the satellite survived, I'm sure it wasn't in any decent working order. But as far as things that, uh, you know, things that they tell us that satellites do, I think that ever since fiber optic cables came out, 
that's where that's what's carrying the the bulk of the load that's what's doing the heavy lifting is fiber optics and undersea cables and we've had that for years and years and years so are there things up there flying around sure uh, are did they go up there because of rockets no no there's, there's no, no point there, there are several videos, and I've, I've done a couple of shows uh, uh, addressing the topics, and, and you have had extensive, extensive uh, um, knowledge of, of, of vacuums. Um, you know, there's several um, videos of uh, even a guy who says he's a scientist saying rockets absolutely do not work in a vacuum. Yeah. Um, which which makes sense, and uh, you have talked about the um, amazing power of uh, of vacuums. Yeah, you know, we actually have um, vacuum lift systems that lift up to thirty thousand pounds, and that's just basically with a giant vacuum cleaner. So yeah, and it's not near a total vacuum. Um, and the idea that uh, an eighth inch shelled aluminum spacecraft can go through a, a near or total vacuum is is, is kind of laughable uh you know um but but yet there there it is that's what we're led to believe and uh and and nasa and as you, you mentioned this in in the project line they contradict themselves and you know oh we'll have adequate shielding now that we've never had before well All right yeah, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. What shielding did you use during the Apollo missions? Which I still think is a is a great trap question. Which is, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, the Van Allen radiation belts, which were announced in 1959 as a very deadly belt of radiation, thousands of miles thick. How did Apollo compensate for that during their missions from uh, nine through seventeen? How did they compensate for that? Because there's only two common metals that can stop radiation. Uh, yeah, of course, water can in, in huge, massive amounts. But lead and gold are the only metals you can use. Lead you use at the dentist's office to protect you when you get x-rays. And gold is the very expensive version, but it's twice as dense as lead. And they didn't use either of that. They just used aluminum and plastic. And it's like, okay, so how did you not spend enough time in these belts? And that's what their, their common excuse is. Oh, we just didn't spend enough time. I'm going, that's fine it, on the way out. I, I get that. You know, you're, you're traveling out. You've got a big rocket booster. Maybe the, a cut two or three hours won't, won't be a big deal as you're heading towards the moon, but coming back, you're hitting the brakes. You're, you're slowing way, way down because you've got to land back on earth with much higher gravity. So how, how are you dealing with that? And they didn't, they, they just said they did and they didn't do any, any such thing. And, and the vacuum, of course, I, I, we could talk about that for a long time, but and let me skim it real quick, which is the power of the vacuum, of, of a vacuum, which is basically no, an, a space where there's no molecules, no oxygen, no hydrogen, no trace gases, no anything. That creates an area of low pressure, which can suck anything. It's, it, you know, it, it's very, very, very strong. It pulls, it pulls matter to it because there's no matter inside that, that chamber. And so it's like, okay, what does that got to do with flat earth? Well, tell me where our atmosphere ends and the power of the vacuum of space begins. Because if we're surrounded by this massive, massive vacuum, uh, of, which is space, that vacuum should suck lighter gases off of anything. Any gas should just be ripped off of, of any planet, including ours. Uh, yeah, it, we really it, shouldn't have an atmosphere. No. And, and not just our planet, but any planet. Uh, Saturn is partially a gas planet. Jupiter has, you know, a whole bunch of gas around it. Uh, Neptune, Uranus, and, the, and those, that, those, that, that gas, I don't care. You know, the, the gravity, yes, gravity supposedly is a very, very strong thing. But compared to the vacuum of space, it's nothing. It's, it's, it will lose every time. We, you can test this, you know, you can pick up a bowling ball with your household vacuum cleaner. In two seconds, you know, and that, that's you're beating gravity right there. Multiply that by thousands of times, and that's what we're talking about—the vacuum of space. So, yeah, it's it's really and and uh, you know the idea of the thermosphere where mm. uh, and and I know, I know they kind of get around my, that by saying, well, uh, 
there's just it, 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 and I don't really understand this. Maybe you can explain. It. If we've got sure. a layer of a thermosphere that yeah. can get up to uh, over four thousand degrees, which anything would melt at that, but they say, <laughs> well, it's a difference between heat and temperature. And to me, that's that's kind of like saying, yeah, it's hot, but it's a dry heat or something. Well, they they say there's not enough molecules in that layer to really heat things up. And you're like, yeah, maybe. But the the satellite's traveling supposedly very, very quickly, and the satellite's made of all sorts of molecules. So... How? What sort of temperature swings are we talking here? You know, it. it the basically, we're, uh, from our standpoint, there is no thermosphere. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing up there because if you believe in the in the thermosphere at all, aluminum melts at a very low temperature. You know, you can you can melt an aluminum can in a bonfire, you know, and that's nothing compared to what they say the thermosphere is. And not to mention all the little plastic parts and all the electronics and uh, no, no, I just not. Not buying it. All all the stuff that they've been pushing at us, mainstream science has been rattling off to us for decades. It just isn't holding up anymore. We we've got access to too much information, and we're we especially with social media, we have the ability to share it instantly with our friends. And all it takes is one person to make an observation that nobody else had made. And mm-hmm. and that, that's what what kind of happened with the uh, with the moon, the the cold being generated by the moon oh yeah 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 that, I, in fact i laughed at it the first time i heard it which was uh when somebody called into the show a couple of years ago end of 2015 i think uh or, yeah end of 2015 where they said that oh yeah did you know the the moon generates a cold light <clears throat> and nobody had really heard that before meaning you, you know what we all was what are you saying that it's cold at night no, we're saying that uh, the moon actually generates a uh, a cold field, uh, a cold uh, like a <clears throat> excuse me, like a cold laser, and in and it was like what? What are you what are you talking about? And so we you know we compare it with the analogy is okay. Well, you know what sunlight is, and so it's like ninety degrees in the sunlight, and it's eighty degree eighty degrees in the shade because the shade is the, whatever object it is is blocking some of the sunlight. And you would expect to see some sort of fraction of that for the moon, but it's exactly the opposite. So if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees in the moonshade. It's warmer in the moonshade, and that shouldn't be. And you can test this anytime you want. You can go to a hardware store and, and buy a point-and-click infrared thermometer, which you use on and just buy all sorts of fun stuff, and for like 15, 20 bucks. And you can you can point point on the ground and point in the moonlight and point in the moonshade and and do tests all day long. We've seen degree variances of up to thirteen, you know, thirteen degrees, which is amazing. And then I suggested when I first heard of this, even though I thought it was nuts, I said, "Well, what happens when you take a magnifying glass to it?" Yeah. Because if you take a magnifying glass to sunlight, you know, you can burn paper, right? But if you take a, a magnifying glass to moonlight, what happens? Does it get does it get colder or does it get warmer? And I'll be darned if it doesn't get colder. It actually gets a few yeah. degrees colder, which, again, we can synthesize this now. This is not a weird technology. We can do this in university labs right now. It's literally called a cold laser. You know, you just modify the frequency and you can generate a refrigerant beam. So you're saying, okay, what's that got to do anything? I'm going, it, well, it doesn't prove flat earth. But it absolutely puts into question the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because up until now, mainstream science has said the sun casts its light on the moon and that reflect and the, the moon you know becomes this bright, bright light because it's reflecting the sun's rays. And it's like, okay, well, if it's reflecting the heating rays of the sun, shouldn't it be generating just a tiny fraction? At the very least, it should be neutral. You know, it should be like not generating any any, any cooling properties cold, at all, but no. it's it's actually transmorgifying. I'm stealing from Calvin and Hobbes there. It's it's transmuting the the light. That's that's what they're going to say now and say, oh, it's turning into a cold light. And scientists will not address it. Will not address no, no, it. I there, there, there's several things. Too. <laughs> yeah, but that one's a that one's a big one because it's easy for anyone to understand and test. This is it's something. It's not like you have to go to a, a university lab. You literally can go to the hardware store, buy one of these things, point and click. You know, it, you know the it's can be done in Fahrenheit or Celsius, and you can test it immediately, and it works. 
absolutely works. I've done it, my, done it myself, and there's plenty of videos online of people that have done it with the magnifying glass to boot. So you like so so you have warmer temperatures in the in the moonshade. You have a cold temperature in the moonlight, and even colder temperatures in magnified moonlight. It's it's just bizarre. Well, the the, the moon is kind of bizarre. Um, yeah. This the session that that, that I'm at uh, prior to January had a uh, a contemporary Christian format, and in January we switched to uh, All Talk, uh, which is a lot of fun, but we still have listeners, of, of course, that are very much Bible believers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would I would say to them in, in Genesis where, you know, God created the sun and the moon and the stars on the fourth day, up until the fourth day, what did the earth rotate around? Where wow. The sun wasn't there, you know. So yeah, yeah. The the idea that the, that um, the sun and the moon were more luminaries, and therefore seasonal benefits and to mark days and that type of thing, to me, right. is is a, a, a way you can go biblically. And and if you want to look at it that way, of course, the idea of a flat Earth is all throughout the Bible, and uh, you're an immovable. We're we're in the movable things with, you know, the stars and sun and all going around us, right? And certainly things like the North Pole star and or even the South Pole star, even though they go in a different direction, it's still things moving around us as a fixed, you know, fixed entity, as it were. Right. But um, the what do you think about? And I I have not seen this myself, but I have seen. A good many pictures involving the sun and the moon of you know stars showing through the moon, uh, clouds behind the sun, those those type of images. They're they're interesting. I don't know if I would bet any folding money on them, but they're they they help us. I know that they they help the community and and help generate interest in the entire concept. Uh, do I think they're absolute proof of what's going on? No, but at the same time, I mean, they're not my favorites, but at the same time, they, uh, I, I, you know, there's some that I like that other people's don't, that other people don't like sun dogs. I, I think that when, when people, now is that where the sun comes in at the different angles? Yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, it looks like it's, it's reflecting. It looks like the sun is actually being, the image of the sun is being bounced off from different angles, and that we have some sort of curved dome uh, is above that us. Corpus, corpus, corpus no, no, corpuscular corpus. rays. No, no, that's even different. But yeah, they all help. They all help the cause. They all because you know a picture is worth a thousand words, and people are very visual nowadays, and their attention spans are very limited. So when people see enough pictures of the corpuscular rays, or if they see people of the, or I'm sorry, if they see the sun behind the clouds, uh, or you know in front of the clouds, or there's clouds around them, or the moon, or thing, or or stars in you know the, in the shadow of the moon, you know the, the the eclipse part. Oh, by the way, I have to mention this real quick, which was after the eclipse. What I thought was interesting because we broke it down pretty quick. There were some of our guys that specialized in Photoshop and studio. And they took the images of the sun and they put it through a whole bunch of filters. And they said, and it was about as appropriate as anything, they said that the sun, there was nothing eclipsing the sun. And what they meant by that was that the sun was self-eclipsing, kind of like the moon. So if you go into a planetarium and you see waxing and waning crescents and quarter moons and half moons and crap like that, that's because the planetarium is just shutting down part of the light source that is the moon on the ceiling. And up until now, we hadn't really thought of the sun in that manner because the sun is always the sun. It's always not a half sun or a quarter sun or a crescent sun. It's always just the sun, the full sun. But when we saw the eclipse, it's like, oh, of course, why wouldn't the sun use the same mechanisms as the moon? And, and it's it's very, very interesting. If you get a chance, look into that where uh, Mike Helmick does a great series of videos showing that the, the sun, there's something blocking the sun, but it's not a three-dimensional object. It's like the, the sun is shutting off part of its own light source. Well, see, things like that, uh, 
tend to uh, increase my belief in a, a type of simulation going on. Yeah. And um, I've, I've uh, listened to at least one guy who had a, I don't know, I, I kind of liked, liked what he was saying. I was trying to trying to um, find the exact end of flat earth image it was not the azimuthal equal distant projection it was like a oblique mercator or something like that does that make sense yeah I'm yeah so anyway, but anyway his his idea was um uh, that we're flat in a flat earth and which is virtual or simulated to some extent or, or whatever mm -hmm. and and basically when the sun and moon go to one end they appear at the other end and they, they're kind of in other words you you walk out walk into the bathroom but you i don't know that's not a good no no i know what you're talking, you're talking about it's it's the yeah that? it's the pac-man model the uh yeah, yeah. which is you go in one side and you're immediately transported to the other side Right. It's something we used to do in early video games to try to solve the, the size of the screen problem. And, yeah, it's it's interesting. And as much as I'd like to say that I don't like it, there are certain aspects from even a biblical side which kind of fall into that. Anyone that's ever looked well, in... Well, it, it, it talks in, I think, the Book of Enoch. Yep, Book of Enoch. Going, going up and... You know, going back up to heaven and starting back. Yeah, there's a there's a series of portals. Uh, the Book of Enoch really didn't make that much sense until you applied it to the the flat enclosed model. The the Book of Enoch basically says, oh yeah, it's a giant machine that you're living in. It's God's machine that that's full mm -hmm. of all sorts of fun little tricks. And uh, it's yeah, it, I, I I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it watching that group, uh, different different sects of our of the Flatters community jump on that. It's been really neat to watch them do that. Well, you know the, I mean at, at some point with uh, what do you want to call them glitches in the matrix, if you want to go the the Mandela route or, or whatever, mm -hmm. there, there's something very very. Uh, true about uh, hard matter, reality that as we understand it, being not the hard and stable entity that we we think it is. It's, right. It's uh, you know, there's for lack of a better word, glitches in the matrix, which uh, certainly I I think a, a simulation type thing would uh, help to explain. And are they glitches or are they deliberate? Because, you know, if you believe yeah. in a perfect system, and I do, I think there are certain things that were kind of put there as breadcrumbs for us to, to, to pick up on. Because you can make perfect software. You can make perfect machines if you want. We, we've come very, very close to, to creating some, some fantastic things. Uh, an advanced civilization or a divine power could do much much better and you know we're we can be look even me I, I can be super dense sometimes and i miss all sorts of stuff until i almost trip over it it's like oh right that so anyway well then yeah, um i'm sorry i interrupted no no go ahead go ahead we're good okay I, I was i had i was just looking at my little notes here uh has anybody asked our buddy Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, with his oblique spheroid pear shaped earth, mm -hmm. why he thinks it's like that when, according to NASA, it's just this perfectly round sphere, according to their... Well, he's been uh, he's been backpedaling a lot recently because of that. Uh, it, it, what you're referring to is when he talked to a university group a couple of years ago where he said that the earth isn't actually a sphere it's an oblate spheroid and on top of that it's bigger below the equator than above the equator which he says is kind of pear-shaped and that really that haunts him to to this day because yes what you're saying is every picture that we're shown from nasa or google earth or whatever you want any image that's ever created of the earth is pixel perfect sphere you know it's it's so now neil is is going and saying well from a visual standpoint, it's going to look like a <laughs> like a perfect sphere, but scientifically, mathematically, 
it's still an oblate spheroid. I'm going, not, no, no. You see, the thing is, when you look up oblate spheroid in in Google and, ty- and click on images, an oblate spheroid, which is basically a squished basketball, looks far, far, far different than, uh, you know, your, your general sphere, your general ball or globe. And to say it's pear-shaped on top of that, I mean, it was... He, he got himself into a whole bunch of trouble because we have latched onto that and uh, people have taken that sound bite and used it a lot. Yeah. Oh, I bet. So in, in the South, we got a joke about a, a, a domineering husband who is caught in, in bed cheating and he tells his wife, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? Oh, so, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's good. That's, Sounds kind. Of, now, I did not realize this, Mark. You you've done two interviews on Coast to Coast. I have, I have. I did one. Are you about the first? The first one was done in May of 2015, and I was I was surprised as anybody because I hadn't, other than the clues, I had nothing out. I mean, my YouTube channel was, was small. I didn't have a website. I don't have any DVDs. The book wasn't even close to being, I had, no one even talked to me about the book yet. And they had, the producer had called me up and said, you know, she was basically, you know, okay, what, you know, like I was some sort of established celebrity person that, that I had already all this stuff. And I'm going, She's, you know, what's your DVD, what's your book, what's your website? And finally, she was getting frustrated because I said, look, I don't even have a website. She goes, why am I talking to you? And I, I said, I don't know. You you called me. Uh, and she goes, she goes, okay, well, give me the pitch. Give me the five-minute nickel tour. Uh, I go, okay. And I, I threw it at her. And she goes, okay, you're going to be on in a week. And I, I had no idea that people uh really want, you know, want to be on that show. There's people that, that contact Coast to Coast all the time and, and want to be on the show. And I had gotten on it because shows listen to other shows. Media listens to other media. That's how it works. Everybody kind of, what's this person doing? You know, everyone's got their own little favorites. Like, okay, if these people are talking about it, then, then maybe I should talk about it. And Coast to Coast listens to another show called Ground Zero with Clyde mm-hmm. Lewis. And I had gotten on Clyde Lewis. And so they had heard me on there and they thought I did pretty well. And so, you know, cause it's all about the producers. It's not about the hosts. It's the producers that they're the ones that find you and they want to make sure that you get along with people and that you're, you're not super controversial and that you're pleasant to deal with. And, and that's really what a producer looks for and that you have an even, even keel, you know, that you don't, you don't get rattled. And mm-hmm. that's why they called me up. And so I, yeah, so a week later I, I did the George Nori thing and he was very nice. And he was real quick to, to right off the bat to say that, 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 you know, that he believes in the Apollo program, which was his way of telling me that I should not attack NASA, and, which is fine. You know, from flatter standpoint, I can, there's all sorts of different routes I can go. I don't need NASA to, to do this. And, and we took calls and, and it went really, really well. And then I, a substitute host for the show also contacted me and uh uh connie was her name and she she had said she said hey i want i would like to get in this and and uh and i said sure why not and so we did that one last year and the same sort of thing and and it re- went really well and so, yeah, two things. And, and uh, the sad thing for me is I can't put them on YouTube. I can't put them anywhere because they copyright them. So yeah. it's the only grow. Everybody else is fine with me, you know, putting myself up there. Uh, but they won't. And so, in fact, I, the, one of my few strikes that I've ever gotten on YouTube was because I did a promo just saying that I had done. Just me talking. You just, you know, really? They, yeah. Just doing just just me saying that we were going to do a show i was going to do a show and and if you wanted the show you'd have to go you know subscribe to coast to coast or something like that and the intern you know he was flagging anything that had coast to coast in the title basically and so i i appealed it and it was overturned in a couple weeks but it was really annoying i'm like really guys but i knew right then that i couldn't so now i've got them on my desktop and if anyone wants them they can just email me and say hey i liked your coast to coast stuff and I'll, I'll just shoot it to them through uh, we transfer or something. You know, it's 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 easy enough. But yeah, it was it was great. A lot of fun to do coast to coast. And yeah. I was um, excited to well, be a part and, of it. And they do, you know, I, now I have not ever even called in on coast to coast, but uh, Ground Zero, I've, I've called in two or three times. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was 
I don't know if it was because of this, but anyway, they they had a guy, and I think this is really interesting. I I don't know if I totally buy into it because I really don't, but it's it's still kind of interesting. You know, the guy talking to uh, that that uh, I can't think of his name, David, somebody anyway, that does the uh, backwards talk. You know, record somebody. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk, yeah. Anyway, I called in. I had a little little my own little story <laughs> about that, and. Um, I had a question for him, and the question was something to the effect of uh, if you look at what people say has changed, like in the Bible, like where it was the lion and the lamb, now it's the wolf and now it's been the wolf and the lamb, and you do that backwards, does any, do you get anything from it? And and the guy, the guest, was seemed very interested and said, no, it's, that sounds like a great idea. It's, you know, it's, and, 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 and the host was saying, well, you know, that probably wouldn't work, you can't read things or something. And then a few weeks later, the next time I called in, I just kind of, it was kind of like I got blackballed, so I don't know if that was a, a taboo topic to hmm. bring that up or or, or what, but uh, I'll, I'll wait again later and, and, and guess I, I'll see. But I'm sure there's certain things that, you know, like the Apollo and those type of things, they're, they're you know, 50,000-watt channel in multiple, uh, you know, in, in multiple cities and, and, and things, and, you know, I'm sure they have to walk a kind of a, maybe it's a wide road, but a road nevertheless. They just can't go out and, and say anything. Yeah, yeah. Na- NASA, up until very recently, has been kind of off-limits. And Flat Earth has kind of developed this sneaky way of getting in and attacking NASA. Because just by talking about Flat Earth, NASA comes into question. Mm -hmm. So all we have to do is say, oh, yeah, the Earth is flat. And then eventually, we don't even have to say anything. And then eventually people say, well, wait, what about what about NASA's been doing? It's like, well, I'm glad you asked that. And then we then we go in from there. We don't, we don't even have to offer up NASA as one of our – it's definitely not the tip of the spear. But it, it comes into conversation, and then we you know, we say, well, what do you think about it? You know, if flat Earth, you know, flat Earth and NASA can't exist as both being true simultaneously, so right. you gotta you gotta look, you gotta ask. And here here is something. Speaking of that, because it's it's not just us. It's it's not just us. Uh, I was listening to to a guy trying to I forgot what he was trying to explain, but he. He said something, and I just said, no, there's there's no way, and I went and checked it out. And whether it is for most, I, as of yet, and you might have heard of it, you may, you're, you're not old enough to remember, I'm old enough to remember, uh, Sputnik, 1957, I had right. just turned four years old, went out with my mother in the front yard, up a little hill we had, and we see a light that we obviously believe is Sputnik. I don't know what it was. It was just some light going across the sky. Mm-hmm. And we were satisfied we'd seen that. It was all in the news for days and days and talked about for weeks and weeks after. But that was October of 1957. Right. Uh, do you know what happened two years later? No. September the 13th, 1959, the Russian... And it was a crash landing, but they landed something on the moon. Oh, I, one of their early probes. The, yeah, the, the... but I had never it. it you know, and I, I was a kid. I would I would know that. I hadn't talked to anybody my age who remembers that ever right. being discussed. It's such a weird thing because that should have been like really big news. It should have been. It should have been. But at the same time, you remember, there's, if it's, if, oh, sorry, you remember, you remember, if the, uh, if it's not. And by the know, way, I think you say, say picture absolutely right. Just put that out there. Oh, okay. The United States, if it's not United States based, we tend to downplay it anyway. So the Russian. It, it, it could have been suppressed, but, but, but still, you know, that I've. You know, I, it, just like that idea. Yeah. You know, that was before Kennedy. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Right. You know, if if this whole thing, which it certainly appears, uh, has a a very false or fakeness to it, it it's not just a, 
not just us. You know, the Chinese, didn't they do a jade rabbit or, or something like that? And well, that's Oh, yeah, well, the Chinese that's supposedly true. have a have a rover on the moon now. It's been there for oh, fi- okay. five years, and, you know, they, they never send pictures back. And they, we, unfortunately, we've been so conditioned to take anything that the mainstream media says as absolute gospel that, you know, they've, they've just been really pushing it. Uh, to where I think the, the, the real pinnacle of it recently was the Elon Musk Tesla, you know, the, the car in space, the red oh, car. Yeah. The car with the, the non-exploding tires in the back. Yeah, yeah. The, that, that's pretty cool. The space-proof car. Yeah, I, I gotta get some of them. Oh, yeah. If somebody start buying that car because that car apparently is indestructible. It can oh, yeah. it can withstand yeah. all the heat changes. Uh, it you know the, the tires don't explode. Well, it's it's a Tesla. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. But, yeah. but again, yeah, they put I, it they I put like... it they put it out there, and we a lot of people bought it. But I will say this: there was a lot more people that didn't buy it, the yeah. because it looked well, so cheesy by comparison. Tell me this now. I've I, I I did a little little segment on the on the show back a few weeks ago, and and it was this guy going into a very uh, for me elaborate it would be for me elaborate um, formulas on uh, propulsion and speed needed. Uh, basically, he said the speed needed to reach low uh, Earth orbit would be eight kilometers per second, and to obtain that, you would need any basically anywhere from 90 to 92 percent of your weight in fuel. Now, to reach uh, the moon, you would have to accelerate up to 14 kilometers per second, and you would end up consuming uh, in weight about 98 percent of your weight would be fuel. But yet, we had fuel enough to take a moon buggy up there, I think not one, not two, but three times, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know there was at least one up there, and, uh, you know, it's it's just crazy. Right. It's it's even crazy to, um, and, you know, the the moon, you know, the astronauts up there walking around with their loose-fitting outfits and the flag flapping in the background and the multi- uh, spots of light. And, oh yeah, don't don't get me started on the moon. There's so the, many. The non crater, <coughs> you know. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, no. Yeah. No. I, I could rattle off like half a dozen right off the bat. Like you know, yeah. The fact that there's shadows that are intersecting. The oh, and and the the Earth in in the background was surprisingly small. Don't yeah. you think? The Earth should be much bigger in the background. Yeah. The spacesuits should not be able to function the way they do because of the vacuum of space. Or the fact that if you speed up the footage by just double it, it looks like they're yeah. walking around at normal speed. Um, no blast crater underneath the, the 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 main unit at all. Not a single speck of dust on any of that beautiful gold foil. Uh, but yet, but yet the astronaut in a, in a dry, moistureless environment that only should weigh about seventy five pounds on on the moon would leave in these deep impressions. In the lunar surface. Oh, not even not even seventy five pounds. Remember, if you believe mainstream science, the moon is only one sixth Earth gravity. So a hundred and eighty pound man should only weigh thirty pounds. Yeah. That I mean, you talk about vertical leap. You should have you know, even a white guy should have a heck of a vertical <laughs> leap. Don't say white man can't jump, that doesn't apply on the moon. Not Absolutely does not apply. Or feats of strength. That means everything, yeah. including that moon buggy should be, you know, it, let's say that moon buggy was, I don't know, 800 pounds. It would be only about 100 pounds and change. You should be able to pick up the front end of that thing in two seconds if you're, uh, you're an astronaut. Uh, you should be able to throw objects much, much further. Uh, there's so many different things about the, the Apollo program that were just wrong. Oh, God, were they wrong. And of course, my one of my favorites is the fact that no one seemed to care that they were on the moon in a very perilous position. You know, it's like, and and they they just singing, dancing, running around, playing golf. It's like never, never worried about their instruments. How much oxygen do we have left? How much? You know, that's all, they would be should be completely petrified all the time about getting back. 
You know, you get that overwhelming oh, feeling. Yeah. But they, nope. Well, they, maybe, maybe they were waiting for the occasional Coca-Cola bottle to roll across. Uh, yeah. Maybe somebody would, would throw on my a Coca-Cola. Yeah, them. it it was. Well, alien, no doubt. It was s- silly. It was just, <laughs> it was just silly. Well, but, no. but, but it held, and it didn't even date that well. You know, it, it didn't hold up well uh, after, over the years. That's the problem. The problem was the biggest. The biggest problem was they use some sort of advertising firm to shoot the shots. The shots were too good. The ones for Time Magazine and Life Magazine. They were they were too iconic. They were always in perfect frame. They they looked like studio production pictures. And, and the cameras were like <clears throat> located about chest high, waist yeah. high, or something. Yeah, yeah, with like no that. with no viewfinder. No, no way to control it. Yeah. No, and and of course, if you're shooting iconic shots, you're going to want to use multiple light sources because that's what professional photographers do. And f- for whatever reason, they didn't have anybody to oversee that. It's like, no, you can only use one light source. What that alone? That if you would have just told the photographers you can only use one light source, that would have extended the lifetime of the life expectancy of those photographs, you know, before people started, you know, squinting at them and, and raising their eyebrows, uh, by years. It's all you had to do. And for some reason it was, it was an oversight. So. Yeah, it's, um, well, you know, that's one, and see, that's one of those, I'm not going to say no win things, but that's something that, that, uh, we grow up being proud of. We were the first people to the moon. And, yeah. You know, look at what we did, and it's something to feel good about. And and somebody like like you or myself comes along, and say, well, you know, I don't want to bust your bubble, but there just ain't no way. Right. People don't want to hear that. You know, that's that's like saying, you know, uh, your mama used to be a hatchet murderer before she married your dad. We didn't oh right, you, but, right, right, right. You know. Yeah, or telling someone they were adopted. Uh, you know, yeah, much yeah. much longer yeah. down the road, you, they don't want to hear it. Uh, or you no, know, nobody likes to hear bad news. They don't, especially if you're, you're really established with, with your belief system. Nobody wants to hear something that goes against it. Uh, like, like if you fought in a, in a major war and you, you find out that war wasn't really justified, uh, or, or again, family stuff or, there's there's little examples, but but with this, I completely understand why people don't want to believe it, especially Americans. Uh, you know, well, raise. You know, here's here's the thing, particularly in 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 the South, and and not to interrupt you, there were a lot of people. I I'm I'm friends with a man who she said, you know, you're like my grandma, but she never believed we went to the moon. I I think the the generation before me, which has pretty well died out now. Yeah. Uh, they were, you know. Here's here's the thing with with um, the ability to think. Um, Two hundred years ago, if if you didn't have it together, uh, you probably wasn't going to survive because right. you know you you had to grow food, you, you you had to build houses. My granddaddy on his farm could fix anything that farm needed, including the car. The radio, if the radio wasn't working, he'd put his hand back there and the TV wasn't warm, he'd take it out and go to the store and get another and put it in. Same thing with the TV. Uh, if the roof needed fixing, he could put another roof on there. Anything right. on there. That ability is gone. Right. Now, you can you can be just barely functional and get by in this society right. fine. You, right. can, you can go and load up some stuff at Walmart and throw it on the counter and throw out whatever... Uh, monetary system you're working with, or, 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 or you know, whatever it be, government supported, not government supported, family, friends, whatever, right. um, and do fine, and 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 survive, and and it, it, it has not always been that way. So, the the ability to think outside the box and be creative, I think, is 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 lessened in in the current generation and. That's not. Oh, when I was a kid, you know, I, I'm, you know, test show this. IQ levels are going down. The brain itself is compared to thousands and thousands of years ago has shrunk because we we don't really have to 
Uh, I mean, even from an evolutionary standpoint, we, we don't have to use this much. We don't have to be as smart. We don't have to be as quick. We don't have to be as creative. And um, I think, therefore, we don't question like we would have. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I won't say that we've been dumbed down. Uh, I, I don't like to, to, to really give consequences to, to, to that. But at the same time, people seem to have gravitated towards the entertainment side of life. You know, the, the old saying is, oh, we don't want to learn anything. We just want to be entertained. And I have heard that now for years, years and years, to where, it, but it, now it, you don't even have to say it anymore. It's just assumed where that's all people are in. They, they want their entertainment fix. They want their distraction from real life. They don't want to know how things work. They don't want to know how to fix things. They just want to get by, as you say. Uh, even even little things. Um and again, you, you probably heard me say that I, I'm not against science. You know, light bulbs are great. Air conditioning is great. Microwave ovens are very interesting to me because almost everybody's got one. But almost everybody doesn't know how they work. And you know, oh. it's like, well, you know, they do what they do. You know, it's got something with molecules. I, you know, it, it's actually more complex than that. But the, the point is, is that, yeah, they just, whatever gets them through in life, whatever it does, let's just do that. And if it's broken you know, because of our disposable society, we just get new ones. We you know, Repair places are closing up as fast as, as anything nowadays. It's not like, you know, with the exception of, I think, vacuum cleaners. I think you, those, those, those places are still out there. You can get stuff repaired. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, an interesting it's time. And even, even our... I teach us this. This is this is a sad little story. Back a few years ago, yeah, uh, when uh, my niece's daughter was in uh, high school, she did a um, um, paper on Teddy Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and uh, very very well researched, very well done paper. And she got a B or C or something. And when her mother approached the teacher and, you know, and said, well, I was kind of upset. She was hoping she'd be, get a better mom. She said, well, honey, I would have liked to given her an A on uh, this paper on Teddy Roosevelt. But, you know, she didn't mention the New Deal because the New Deal was FDR, not Teddy. Oh, right. Well, the teacher. The people, yeah. people, yeah, people do confuse those two quite often. But yeah. oh yeah, don't oh, don't don't get <coughs> your teacher shouldn't Yeah, you well, your gut yeah. <laughs> I mean students we we've all seen the stuff where you know the man on the street talks to whoever and says you know, asks some questions oh, yeah. about history and, and nobody knows anything. Uh Roosevelt, I, I, I kind of give him a pass because there's so many people that, that confuse the two and they weren't that far apart. That was the other thing. You know, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt was the turn of the century, and FDR was uh, during World War II, and of course during the part of the Depression and, and stuff like that. But the uh, yeah, we're we're horrible. Oh my God, I have done so many little rants on. I mean, even little things. You know, part of it's propaganda. You know, if you push something, it's like who won the Revolutionary War, and people say, oh, it was the Americans. You know, they the the, the rebels of, of the uh, the war. It's like, no, no, it was the French that won the Revolutionary War. Or, you know, what to, you know, all, every other major American war that we've had, and most people don't even, but what scares me is most people don't even know a lot of it even happened. So if I bring up like the War of 1812, there are people just look oh, at yeah. you, or, or the Mexican-American War. A lot of people don't know that happened. The Spanish American War, lots of people don't. I mean, that's Spanish American War is how uh, Teddy Roosevelt even got elected as president because he was a hero of that war. And yet, and the um, uh, the Battle of I, I mentioned the um, the War of eighteen twelve, the Battle of New Orleans. That was Andrew Jackson. The only reason Andrew Jackson's on the twenty dollar bill is because, and and so people, yeah, there's people that will drag their kids to Mount Rushmore. And they won't even know why Teddy Roosevelt's up there. You know, it's like, oh yeah, Washington, yeah. Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt. And be like, okay, why is who who's he? Because he's not on any money. So yeah. and and that it it takes something really obvious. Yeah, the only people who even know about George Washington is because it's in their wallets, and Lincoln. Oh yeah. 
And well, you know that that goes goes back to um, you know we just as as a society seem to be so sensitive to things like people saying, well, George Washington had slaves, so uh, so did Thomas know, Jefferson. We, we, yeah, yeah, Thomas Jefferson. Well, uh, Abraham Lincoln's vice president, Andrew Johnson had been a slave. Yeah. He was an indentured servant which escaped. He escaped. A price was put on his head and they were just they were just really basically slaves because right. their indenturement never went went away, basically, for, for many of them. And um, you know, so I, is this it... is some you, you told us something interesting about the civil war mm -hmm. and this was something i found out interesting and, and I'm, I'm i might have mentioned but there was a the vice president of the confederacy who i can't think of was somehow friends with his students i don't know but anyway he was friends with lincoln through i think maybe andrew johnson i'm not sure there was some connection there mm -hmm. and they were working on a plan to end the war and the plan would be that the that the southern troops would go out toward Texas. The northern troops would would come out after the southern troops. They would join together, take over Mexico, and the um, president of the Confederacy would be the president of Mexico and probably part of Texas or whatever. Interesting. And th that was that was actually a a plan that was considered. Sure, why not? Uh, interesting concession, which is all right. Well, you know, the South will die, you know, from a from a continental United States, but at the same time, uh, well, that's an interesting little take on it. I I had not heard that one until just now. That's mm -hmm. good. It's good, yeah, but it but and, it didn't uh, wasn't going to happen though. Now Lincoln Lincoln he, he didn't want to go along with that. No, I would imagine not. Yeah, and Lincoln and Kennedy. Two presidents that both created their own currency. Lincoln, of course, with the greenbacks, and Kennedy with silver certificates. Right. Both shot in the head. Yeah. Um, Andrew Jackson, of course, ran on doing away with the central banks, and he was shot, but not killed. Uh, and then uh, Wilson comes in in the early 1900s and reinstates the central banks, and yeah. Uh, and that, and that, to me, kind of, you know, is. To me, not off topic because this this whole idea of globalism and NASA and Russia and other countries doing doing things together, mm -hmm. as it were, or you know, it's just like we said before: the Russians and and the Americans aren't really that big enemies. In fact, they're they're friends on a lot of levels. Oh yeah, and it's... and uh, you know, there's this undertone, at, at least for me, of this. Uh, these global elites that all don't look at individual countries yeah. and get upset when people do. So yeah, yeah, the Russians have not. Uh, we we talk a good game, and yeah, we're the two biggest kids on opposite corners of the street. But the we've never had a direct skirmish ever, and we've been posturing at each other for a long, long time. And well, you can make a lot of money posturing. Absolutely, you can. I mean. And, and, but and yeah, and of course we're, we're, we tell our troops, you know, like, well, you know, better dead than red and don't trust the Russians. And the, you know, every, it seems like every month there's a new story about, oh, you know, tensions escalating between the United States and Russia. And that's all, I mean, I'm sorry, you can only put, put that story out there so many times before well, it's like, know, uh, it's I, I don't know here in the South, we, we've had wrestling for a long time and it's just an extension of that. You know, you, yeah. you're going to kill each other's mamas in, in, in the ring and go have a beer after the match. Right. Uh, together. It's, uh, it's theater. Yeah, it's, it's theater. it is, it's theater and it's, and it's worked very, very well. I have no doubt that at the highest level, we have some sort of agreement because we're really not that different. I mean, yeah, we've got different uh, economic policies, but we were, you know, we were there with each other during World War II. And we were there, and, and you've heard me tell the story about the Civil War side of it, where, uh, because people, it's like, look, the, the, the Civil War, the American Civil War was not, uh, it was not about slavery. It wasn't even really about money. It was about the Great Britain taking their third and final shot 
at trying to take back the colonies, take back the new world, because it, the United States is a very valuable piece of uh, property on on all levels. And they knew this. They knew this because of the Revolutionary War. They knew this because of the Battle of it, the War of 1812. And then it took them several decades later, and they 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 the advisors every the the south was set up it was not supposed to be the south versus the north it was supposed to be the south and great britain versus the north which would have been a very very different war it wouldn't have been a five-year war it would have been um much more devastating and the british and the south had a good chance of winning uh, all the weapons that were that were used in the in the south were, were supplied by the the british military the ships all built in in british shipyards um, if anyone has any doubt, look up the CSS Alabama, you know, the, the Confederate sloop of war built in Great Britain, sunk like 50 some ships and everything about it was, was Great Britain. They had a vested interest in it. Did I ever tell you this story? You, you, you did, but tell it again. Cause okay. it's, it's really fascinating. It's an interesting story. And the North was worried. The North, of course, you know, we, we knew what was going on. I should say we. The North knew what was going on. It was like, okay. And they were very, very concerned because the South and Great Britain, if you had the, the British Navy protect, you know, backing up the South, they weren't going to send troops, but the British Navy would have been uh, you know, very effective at shutting down the, the Northern shipping routes. Uh, and stopping immigration, you know, the new troops from coming in because you know they were signing up troops basically off the boat, to, off uh, anyone that was that was going into the north from from Europe. They were like, okay, how would you like to be a U.S. citizen? We'll guarantee it. Just put on a freaking uniform and and here's a rifle, and we'll just you know they had a they had much more uh, uh, access to replenishing their their troop movements. So the Abe, Abraham Lincoln said, okay, he's going to take a, take a uh, a last uh, you know hail mary and he sent a letter off to the czar of russia which i think at the time was, i should remember this but memorize this by now was uh, nicholas the first i think and nicholas has this letter in front of his chief of staff and and says okay i'm gonna open up this letter from lincoln but just so you know whatever he asks we're gonna do it whatever whatever request he has and you gotta remember a lot of foreign leaders respected Lincoln for whatever reason I you know I don't know exactly what you know maybe it was charisma because the man was a failed politician for a long long time before he became president and the letter said one simple thing again this is this is all rumor and hearsay but I buy it I absolutely buy this story where this said keep Great Britain out of the war that's all he asked mm -hmm. was keep them keep the British out of this thing and so Nicholas contacts the the british uh king of whoever was running the uh, britain at the time and said okay if you guys get involved we're getting involved basically it'll be your navy and our navy and then that would have turned into the first world war because you would have had the uh the north and the russian navy versus the south and the british navy oh what a what a what a yeah. what a Donny Brook that would have turned out yeah, to be. It, it, it could have been more wild. Oh, it would have been amazing. And the and British said, That's it, we're out of here, we're done. And they left the South hanging out to dry. And it was, and at that point the, the South did not have the, the resources for a long term campaign. And that was it. The British stayed out, the Russians stayed out. And you said, Oh, it sounds like a good story, but you know, I, I'm going with the whole, you know, South just seceding on their own for no apparent reason and, and doing their own thing. And I said, well, that, that's good and all, but you got to remember what happened. The, 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 the tip off was the very end of the war. What happened when after those five years, even though both sides were completely broke, you know, the, especially you know, North it spent tons of money and hundreds of thousands of men died. Russia sold a large but seemingly worthless piece of real estate to the North. I mean, right after the war was over and you know what it was called. Alaska, Alaska, it, because it, Alaska belonged to the Russians, uh, and it was amazing. Why? Why would you know? The, we we had no business buying any piece of real estate, and of course it worked out for us in the end because they discovered oil up there later because oil wasn't even a thing back during the Civil War, and that was that was the, them calling in their market. It's like okay, we did this favor for you. Now you have to do this little thing for us, and we got they got a whole bunch of gold, and we got this this state. What ended up being a state, but. 
it was, of course, that was what you would do. And they got, and both sides actually worked out pretty well because technically Russia didn't have to do anything. It's not like they were massing troops at the border or anything like that. I mean, yeah, they were probably prepping their navy, but monetarily, just the threat. yeah, just the threat was worth it. And it was an interesting story. And again, we don't, we never paint that. We paint the more romantic version. It's like, oh, Lincoln did it for the slaves, and it was all about the slaves. It's like, no. Ultimately, it was no. about money and power. In, in, in fact, not to bust anybody's bubbles, but Lincoln made public speeches speeches that uh, hailed the superiority of the white race compared to the black race. Uh. And he was, you know, and he famously said, um, you know, one country with slavery or, or without slavery. He right. didn't care, but it was just going to be one country. So um, don't don't think he you know he did things that that turned out good but maybe not for the reasons that yeah uh, yeah i mean look history isn't i know we've all heard history is written by the winners but the one that i like more is the one that napoleon said which is history is just lies that are agreed upon (laughs) and it's true i mean you sit down after you win the war you sit down at your boardroom meeting table and you say okay how are we going to spin this yeah, because the this yeah the because the public wants a friendlier version of what really happened they do yeah. they they don't want to know why you know that you know they they want to know that the battleship maine was blown up by the spanish for no reason whatsoever and that it was revenge that is the i will say this the old tricks are the best tricks and people fight for revenge we always have, we always will. It's the oldest trick in the book. You've done it in the schoolyard where you hit somebody in the back of the head and when they turn around, you point at the guy next to you. Mm. That's, that's, that's the easiest way. It's like, I didn't do it, he did it. And, and of course, he's going to take a swing at that guy because he's already charged up. Uh, we, you know, the, ba- the revenge, the, the uh, Spanish-American War, revenge for blowing up the battleship Maine. The Mexican-American War, revenge for, for taking out the Alamo. Uh, even though they could have saved the Alamo. And it's like, no, 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 let's let this sucker fall. And, you know, yeah. 200 men. And, and think of the investments. Look at the payoffs. Remember, it's all about money and and, and territory. Um, you blow up, you let one battleship blow up, the battleship Maine. And what do you get for that? We, you know, because Spain was weak. That was all it was about. We knew we could take it. And um, we grabbed Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and we could have taken Cuba. If we really, you know, set our minds to it, uh, you let the Alamo fall. That's even a bigger one. What do you get for that? Oh, let's see. Texas, New Mexico, because, you know, it used to be old Mexico, uh, Arizona, and that little piece of worthless real estate called California. (laughs) Four states we got for just letting one fort fall. 200 guys. Don't tell me that you can't put a price on human life. You absolutely can't. We're talking well, about tr- trillions of dollars worth. Of... Always been false flags, I guess. Yeah, always false flags. I mean, the fact that, that I mean, the the term false flag, most people don't even know where that's come from, and that is, it's an old old trick, and that is, you you fly somebody else's flag on the way, you know, while you're coming close to another ship, so they don't fire upon you. It's like, hey, we're your friend. Hey, we're your friend. No, we're not. Fire, you know, and then you you <laughs> blow them to smithereens or do whatever you have to. Um, uh, there's a, the old saying, and I don't want to, I don't want to drag this out, but all's fair in love and war. And that is, yeah, you, you, you do the dirty tricks to win the war. And then when you're done, you hide those tricks, you hide your motivation, you hide the reason why you were fighting in the first place, because, and it's mostly for the mothers that are out there. I don't want to pick, but it's mostly for the mothers because mothers want their sons to fight for noble causes. They, that's what it's all about. They don't want, they don't like the idea of having their sons fight for greed and money and power. It's, they, they want them to fight for something that, that not, it doesn't even have to be, rom- be romantic, but it has to be for honor and goodness. And so if that's what you have to change the war to be after the fact, that's what you do. And it's just the way, the way the world works. Anyway, what, what other, what other little things you want to throw at me before we... Well, you know... Uh, my wife and I were listening to CNN, not, no, I'm sorry, we were listening to Fox, and they were covering a story that CNN had done about some uh, um, U.S. Uh, submarine maneuvers in Antarctica, 
and they're they're there, and this uh, submarine had surfaced through the ice. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the reporter casually says, "Well, you know, GPS doesn't work down here." Just casually mentioned it. I'm thinking, "Well, it doesn't work over the oceans either." Um, yeah. And why would why would that uh, statement not be questioned? I right. Mean, if it, if we did have, it's global. Yeah, you, you you can't. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, you don't you don't make that connection. Uh, when I was looking for iconic photos of the Earth from space back in two thousand, and I could not find them. I, I could only find that one shot from Apollo seventeen. Literally, I searched the entire internet, could not find it. Anything else? Uh, my my thought wasn't that there was something suspicious or there was something wrong. It was that I, I literally just said, oh, NASA, you suck at your internet presence and you've got to get some more photos out there because this is just pathetic. Oh, yeah. um, the, the GPS not I working. They did. I think they did get some more photos out there. Well, they did finally, but it took all the way until another 15 years before they before they did it. Uh, your I, mean, average... I think there are photos that didn't actually exist up until that time, but uh, that's besides the point. Right. Uh, yeah, reporters, they they don't, unless you're an investor, unless you're already uh, looking for the suspicious stuff, it's not going to hit you. You know, you don't, it's like, oh, GPS isn't working. It's a benign enough comment that you're you're not going to question it. I wouldn't question it. Unless I was in a flat earth, it'd be like, wouldn't even occur to me. It's like, why wouldn't it work? You, yeah. Unless you know something about the GPS system, that it's supposedly 32 overlapping blanket covered satellites, there shouldn't be any dead spots. Uh, but again, that goes along with you know Matt Boylan's thing, where he was talking to some NASA guys at a party, and they said, "Oh yeah, GPS doesn't." This was back to early two thousands, where he, they they said, "Oh yeah, it doesn't work down there." Yeah, yeah. here's a, a, another kind of innocuous statement that would be, I think, innocuous for for most people, and I think it came from from a former astronaut. I'm pretty sure I'm correct in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the question was poised to him. Um, why don't we go back to the moon? And his answer was very off the cuff. He says, well, you know, that's old technology that we don't have anymore. So right. we don't have the technology to go back, which is kind of like saying, you know, we don't have slide rules anymore. You know, right. I lost my slide rule, and, and there's a no slide rule store, and we can't figure out the calculation <laughs> it's, because we don't have slide rules. It's the only technology that i know of that's supposedly not reproducible compared to everything else we look we can we can make we have the blueprints and we have the ability to make any of our old tech you know like uh slide projectors right nobody uses slide projectors anymore at home but we, we've got them lying around it's not like we, we can't dig one up or if we had to fabricate one in two seconds. Uh, so why, you know, or old telephones, which nobody uses anymore. We've got the, you know, those are lying around too. So why, why is it that rocket technology is the stuff that can get them to the moon, which should be state of the art? We, we, I've never seen anything where we've gone backwards in capability like we have with the, the, the space program. Well, one of the excuses is, you know, everything has has been lost. Now we put it, we put it in a box, and we wrote import and and put it under the stairs. Right. And I think one of the cleaning ladies threw it away. Yeah. I mean, we did everything. We did our due diligence, and we we wrote on that box import, do not throw away. And I doggone it, I think the cleaning lady threw it away. Right. Right. It's yeah. It's it's silly. And NASA's excuses they can only go so far. But I, if anyone has any doubt of that, again, look up the Orion trial by fire video, which is them talking about the Mars program, where they say that we can't. The first capsules we send up there will be unmanned because we haven't figured out how to solve the radiation problem with with deeper space. And it's like, what are you what are you talking about? You already solved it in the '60s, multiple times, perfectly. I might add, without any casualties. And all the astronauts lived long lives. Nobody even got cancer. They they all you know nobody died of radiation poison, and so nobody even developed a tumor. So how can you say that you 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 don't know how to do this anymore? It's it's a silly statement. But again, because the the general population is so entertainment based, they don't even question it. They don't even get suspicious about it. 
uh, until recently. Anyway, we find that what you know that's part of what the flat Earth has been doing, which is getting people to ask the questions they normally wouldn't ask, and I'm I am very proud of that that part. Uh, this uh, this this guy that that uh, made this I thought pretty well done flat Earth video kind of related in, into uh, his ideas of what it would appear if some or all of it was part of a simulation, mm -hmm. uh, made this statement, which I wanted to run by you. He said, for the most part, and I don't know there's time changes, but wherever you are on Earth at high noon, the, the, the sun is directly over your head. And his point was that to him, that was evidence that the, the sun is more or less a, a rendered projection to a particular person at that point in time that it that it, it it really shouldn't be over everybody's head in that particular time zone straight up now i don't know if he's right in saying that or not but i thought it was kind of no that that, that fits in with some of the um uh, the digital versions that we do, which is, it's called instancing, which is you can create a, an image based on geographic location and you can tailor it to just about anything, uh, even an individual, if you want, which is why when you look at the, the old stories, you know, the miracle of Fatima with a, with a dancing sun in the sky, which doesn't make any sense at all. And everyone mm -hmm. said, you know, all those thousands of people said, oh, yeah, we saw the sun and it was moving around in weird, bizarre patterns. And and the average person would be, well, no, that can't be because, you know, I saw the sun that day too and it was fine unless you were took, looking at two completely differently rendered suns. Yeah. Which is, yeah. is easy for us to do from on a small scale in a digital realm. Yeah. So. It, uh, it's, it's kind of deep. <laughs> I agree. Honest. I agree. Uh, you, uh, you're. I've I've heard you on. Uh, I, I know at least at least a, a couple of uh, uh, a couple of YouTube talk shows or whatever mm -hmm. non flat Earth related kind of stuff. What's what's your your favorite non flat Earth related favorite non flat Earth? Ooh. Yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going to do like your like the British interview and make you do it in in in, in two sentences and no uh, my favorite my favorite non flat earth conspiracy well just just topic whatever whatever um boy that's a tough one I like so many uh and if I say something I'm probably gonna change my mind later it would probably be the probably be one of the wars because the wars are so fascinating how they how they spin it which would be you know what i won't even do the jfk thing i'll, I'll do because that's too easy i i'll go with pearl harbor is oh one, yeah and and the reason is because you uh the the you've question of whether or not pearl harbor was attacked deliberately or not and there's you know, those stories have been swirling around ever since you know it, before there was it was one of the early conspiracies in america which was how did it just happen to be so convenient people forget that germany was winning that war uh, they took on the entire world with with advanced technology and wherever they got that from and they were winning and they were winning quite easily i might add considering they were such a small country and I mean, the, Russia was in flames and the UK was just getting hammered and they, it was just a matter of time. All they had to do was wrap up Russia. That's all they really had to do. You know, England can wait. And their ultimate goal, because there were so many German citizens already over in the United States, their ultimate goal was to annex the United States without firing a shot. They didn't want to go to war with the United States. That was the last thing they wanted to do. They, they wanted to fly dual flags because no one was going to find out about the Holocaust. No one was going to find out about any other things they did. They, you know, the, the news was, was tougher to come by back then. And as long as the United States didn't get into the war, everything was going to be just fine. And then Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. 
and then immediately the next day a million Americans signed up for the draft or you know signed right. up it, volu it, volunteer it went from an 80 percent disapproval rate of getting into the, to the war to everybody wanted to go yeah yeah and remember what I said people fight for revenge that's what they do and you, what do we do you sacrifice a couple thousand at Pearl Harbor damage an, oh, an, an antique World War one Navy and right, right. and our good stuff was not in Pearl Harbor no it, it, it was it was outside yeah yeah and, uh, and fr from what I understand you know uh, of course um, Roosevelt had been getting daily updates and, and probably hourly updates on where the Imperial fleet was yeah so he knew exactly where they were going and they had the younger old the younger naval crew with the older uh, antiquated ships there for bait and supposedly uh, they had gotten intel that there were going to be three strikes right and and they were going to get the fleet coming out on the third strike and they did one strike and kind of figured out something fishy and took off so we, we kind of missed that but uh, yeah. uh, the, the thing that, that, that I always gets me in, and I hope this isn't true hmm. but I kind of believe it is uh, you know, many of those ships that were sunk were sunk in rather shallow water, and they said for uh, over a week they could hear uh, sailors inside uh, banging on the holes, but nobody was allowed to to try to, to rescue them. Oh yeah, they didn't have the they didn't have the tech to to rescue them even in in they shallow. Didn't have the ability. Nope, to do it. nope. Well, how are you going to do it? I mean, you punch a hole. You don't, I mean, yeah, if you yeah, had... If you cut the hull underwater, you, you, they're dead anyway. Yeah, they're dead anyway. I mean, it was it was unfortunate. And yeah, I mean, we're, to, we're talking one of your bigger uh, sacrifices of lives to, a, to achieve a bigger goal. But at the same time, think of all the military moves. It's, it's really chess. And that is you sacrifice pieces to as yeah. bait for other pieces. We do it in, in the battlefield all the time. You just don't oh, tell... Yeah. You don't, don't tell that particular group. You never tell them. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, your survival rate on this mission is going to be pretty slim because you're supposed to draw the enemy out. And Y'all over there, y'all are human shields, okay? There you go. You human. Go and get shot, and, and we're going to shoot them from this side. Yep, human shields. And uh, But remember, the, the story, it was a bigger picture, which was if you do not do this, Germany takes the world. And and you could not have been more you couldn't have been more blunt and, than and and we had very friends in very high places you know the uh, I don't know if it was Bush Senior's father or grandfather you know he was he was friends with Germany and basically uh, laundering money uh, uh, for for Germany and it was he was convicted for that and oh I yeah think he yeah, I, yeah look, because he was in the you know, doing the NSO thing. Or uh, IBM. NSO thing, really. IBM during the, the early days of their, you know, international business machines. They sold they sold all the, the counting machines to, and I, I am a believer in at least part of the Holocaust. You know, whether the numbers were exaggerated, that's one thing. But, you know, the, co heck, Coca-Cola had a plant in Berlin. And it, they, did they shut down? No. They just retooled and rebranded and created a brand new soft drink directly for the German people that was called Fanta, which I'm uh -huh. sure, which I'm sure you've heard of, because Coca Cola was to, uh, tied too closely with with America, you know, Americana, and so they decided to create Fanta instead and use the same bottling plant. Uh, Do you remember? I don't know if it was the Kansas City bomb or the night, but it was Terry Nichols and the yeah, 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 guy. those guys, yeah, okay. One of them, I don't know if it was Cherry Nichols or others guys, wife uh, was like a Filipino Muslim, and so, so they they what was said was part of the reason, and they again getting back to revenge. Um, during World War Two, the orders were given in the Philippines, so that was a, a big bloody thing anyway. That the uh, Filipino Muslims were seen as the enemy, as you know, our troops were given all the, if you, uh, you know, if, if somebody was there old enough to hold a gun, take them out. And, right. You know, huge, really, and it was like three million, you know, wow. three million were, were taken out. And they would, 
that would kill everybody in the village and, and leave a few to dig a big pit, push everybody in, and, of course, they'd, they'd kill those. Yeah. I mean, just horrific kind of kind of things that uh, that uh, occur in the war. Yeah, you know, and... Uh, and l- let me not uh, end this part on a on a down note. And by the way, I, I do have a family thing I gotta I gotta go to, but I wanted to I wanted to mention this, which is if you had a choice, it, conspiracies have their place in life, and that is they usually boil down to decisions that are made without your consent, meaning decisions that you probably would be unable to resolve yourself the pearl harbor thing a perfect example and that is look you're you're a a leader in power right germany is going to win this war you know they've already taken europe you know russia's in trouble england is in trouble and there's plenty of german citizens that are already uh, living in the united states what do you do if you want to retain your power you know they're going to come over here and just kick any politicians they're just going to lose their jobs and men hate giving up power what would you do you're going to let them you let them come over here and just fly the flags and and have hitler doing a tour of the united states and start teaching everybody german what is what are you willing to do to keep your way of life and so people say oh no you know i wouldn't sacrifice this it's like well you're thinking short-sighted you know, you of course you would. You know, what would what would the average mother do to protect her family? I know mothers that would do just about anything, which is why I, in my survival guide I wrote that I go, look, they they will do anything to, especially young children. They will do anything to protect their children. Uh, multiply. Well, a, a rabbit gnaws its legs off when it's caught in the trap. There you go. Uh, people, you'd be, be amazed at what people are willing to do. Uh, the the battle, oh boy, was it Stalingrad? The the 900, or Leningrad, Stalingrad, I think, a 900-day siege where the Germans surrounded Stalingrad for literally two years and change. And the people there endured amazing hardships uh, and resorted to unbelievable things when pressed. Uh, don't don't ever doubt the human survival instinct. The, the cons- most conspiracies we're talking about, they're that's the early stages of survival instinct and there are people who are willing to do just about anything to maintain their way of life so well i know i know you gotta go let me ask you one quick question yeah. non-fat earth related just because you you know a lot about this and just so you, sure you take on it uh you remember back oh i guess it's been a year more ago the no far far some flat earth yeah came out, yeah yeah, yeah. The, the trees and mm-hmm. the devil sour and all that uh and there's another thing now that the people are looking at mud fossils, where right, you you know you know about that. What do you think about that? Um, it's not one of it's not in my top ten. I I think it's very possible. The what I've been trying to tell people is is flat Earth. One of the side effects of of being in flat Earth is extreme open mindedness, which means you you're open to concepts you never would have given the time of day to even even of last year and I was that way you know and I initially yeah I, I kind of brace against it when I first hear it like the moon temperature or no for or the fact that that mountains uh, like Devil's Tower are just chopped off old versions of trees uh, or the mud fossils or the uh, jet fuel conspiracy it's fine you know I, I I'm open-minded to it do I think it's gonna get much traction no probably not uh, because there's there's too many other things in the way, uh, but it's an interesting an interesting topic. And again, you can blame flat Earth for it being brought up uh, at this point. I'm, yeah, yeah. So. Well, you, you you said that about several topics because if it were not for for flat Earth, then it, it uh, yep. well well the no no forest on uh, flat Earth. For yeah. Instance, well, yeah, that that that, that video would have never even gotten off the ground, but because flat Earth existed, it, it just started running, and there's a lot, there's millions of hits on those things, on those videos now. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's 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 interesting, and uh, you know, to j- just the concept of a world radically different right. from from what we live in, and you know, they they come out with saying, well, you know, there was a massive fire and 99 percent of the biosphere were destroyed and yeah. you know you get a completely different uh, 
uh, picture, which uh, which is which is interesting. Yeah. But anyway, my friend, I know you got to go, and I, I appreciate it so much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, tell us, um, uh, of course, you're on YouTube. You've got uh, your show, Strange World, every Tuesday night on yep. Tree Frequency Radio, yep. uh, seven Pacific, ten Eastern. Mm-hmm. Um, you gave us this number, 641-793-7115, if you just want to call in and listen, if you don't have computer access. Sure. Um, book, which I didn't bring today. Uh, that's didn't okay. Today. Uh, yeah, the book, Flat Earth Clues, yeah, uh, also on Ama- Clues, Amazon. Is, is yep. Right. Uh, and you've got the documentary. Which is uh, behind the coming, curve. It's going to be coming coming out, uh, premiering next month, and then we'll see if it goes into mass production after that. Cross my fingers. Oh yeah. Well, it should. If it doesn't, it should. It should. Um, unless uh, anything. Uh, in the, now the, you said there's um, going to be a uh, big flat Earth conference in edmonton canada in august there is the national conference is going to be in denver in november and anything beforehand we're just kind of winging it so i'm i'm flying out to different meetups done pasadena did colorado springs just a little while ago so you know anyone that wants me to come to a meetup hey just Give me a plane ticket and get me out there. I will. Uh, I will go to your meetup. But yeah, there's. You can't beat that. You can't beat that. No. Wow. No. Shop around. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, you know, we're about 90 miles from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. We're 30, 40 miles from Columbus, Georgia. We're 80 miles from Montgomery, Alabama. Anything happening in this area that you're aware of? There are, but you're going to have to look it up yourself. Uh, unfortunately, there's so many meetups. Just type in Flat Earth Meetup in, and then pick a city near you. And okay. uh, you'll, you'll see, they'll be all listed. I do as many promos as I can on YouTube, but I would go into YouTube and just look Flat Earth Meetup. And, and then... kudos for doing that. Oh, well, thanks. I think you might be the only one that does that. On the first uh, I, well, it's easy. I've got templates so I can crank them out pretty quickly. Uh, but it's kind of fun because then I can I can tell people and if people let ask me it's like, hey, what's what's happening around my area? I can I can sort of shoot them things if I remember them. And, and I want to say the last time we talked mm-hmm. was uh, right before or right after Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I think your subscribership was in the 40s, and now it's 52, 4, 58. Yeah. So it just keeps going up by leaps and bounds. Yeah, it's been, again, a wild ride, and I, it's great. And there's people, lots of people with, with more uh, more subs than, than me, but at the same time, I've gotten a chance because I'm kind of the, the tour guide. For flat Earth, I I get interviewed more than most, but that's fine. I don't I don't mind. It's part of what I do, and I just accept my role. Well, I think it's the the uh, dedication of your subscribers that uh, you know. I'm sure there's probably some funny cat YouTube channel out there that has millions and millions of subscribers to. Sure. Like I said, that's the entertainment value, and and this isn't. Particularly, it may be somewhat entertaining, but it's not entertainment. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I try to try to teach people some stuff. Try to sneak it in, like uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Try to trick them, yeah. trick, trick yeah, them into learning. Yeah, there you go. Well, any any last uh, any last uh, thing you'd like to, to touch? On? Yeah, yeah. Anyone that's listening to this for the first time and and thinking that I'm some sort of mental patient, d- don't take my word for it. Do your own research. Ask questions. And try to resolve it for yourself because you are not alone in the universe. You're not living on this tiny ball that's just flying through space that could be snuffed out at any time. You are in a enclosed, pressurized building, a giant structure that was designed just for you. So enjoy. There you go. That sounds good. Mark Sargent, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Thank you. you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.